but in general, I do try to record these lectures so that they are easy to access for students. Um, Cause, you know, if you get sick and you can't be here, it's gonna make it tricky. So, all right. So this is 3223, which is data structures and algorithms. The content of this is very sparse for good reason. This is the first time I'm teaching this class. Um, this is typically taught by either Professor Hughes or Professor Shi at uh, main campus. And this is the first time this is, this is not only the first time this is being taught here in, um, you know, at TUJ. This is the first time it's being taught in the summer at Temple, at Temple period. And in case you're curious, first time 2168 was taught over the summer was also TUJ. So, so um, and I did that one too. So, um, good track record so far. Okay. So, um, this is your textbook, Algorithms by Dasgupta. This is the first edition and the only edition of the book. It uh, is extremely easy to find online. In fact, uh, first off, if you go to files, you can find our slides for the course. Um, which I've already uploaded. In fact, if we pull up our slides, which I, which I have here, I don't even know why I'm re-downloading it. I have them. It's being slow, so I'm just going to go in. It's going to just go and open the file. Okay, so slides. So here... So I've discovered a few things about these slides as I've been going through them and also doing some last minute thing today. This is like a set of slides that gets passed a bunch, around a bunch of different schools and everybody makes their own changes to them. So Min, Min, Mindy, uh, she, Professor Shi, she made the most recent set of changes to them. Um, and as you can see, how easy is, the, is, the, is, it to, is it to find? She included a link, or somebody who created this set of slides included a link to find the textbook online. Um, the authors put up their final draft of the book while it was in development online and it's been available ever since. It's a good textbook. Um, when I got it, it was 50 bucks. It was still 50 bucks. I don't know how accessible it is in Japan. It's like seven, it's like, uh, what, 7,000 yen or something like that on, online, which is expensive, but compared to other textbooks, not so bad. So, but then again, as you can see, it's been easy to find online. Um, so just wanted to get that out of the way. So with regards to our, um, let's just go over the, the br briefly over the syllabus and how I want to do this course because again, this is the first time I'm teaching this, so a lot of experimentation. So if you'll be, you know, tolerant with, with how I'm going to be doing stuff, I'll, I promise I'll be, you know, tolerant with you about like making sure things are getting done correctly. Um, I've already put, uh, print, I've already posted the first homework. Um, but, and that's, on, and that's gonna be on uh, the exercises from chapter zero in this book, which is the preliminary chapter. Um, so, all right, first off, office hour. So office, it's not to be determined, it's 509. We know it's in 509 now. Um, and my office hours are, and I'll put this up on the one on, on, the, syllabus, uh, on the actual syllabus online. It'll be Tuesday and Thursday, right before this class. If you need to meet with me otherwise, just email me and I'll meet you over Zoom. Um, I've, I've got a fairly open schedule until mid-June. Mid and then once my family gets here, I'll probably be doing stuff over the weekend, but I'm fairly flexible for meeting. So I didn't update, the, I didn't update this copy for a while. Um, but regardless, we're going to be doing plenty of assignments here. Uh, I figure we're going to do some uh, quizzes in class. Not very stressful. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll see. Again, this is just a matter of just trying to figure out, again, how I want to do this class. Um, our midterm will occur sometime during the graph section, so after like chapter four or so. Um, so when we get the chance to look at shortest, probably after we talk about Dusk, uh, about uh, Dijkstra's algorithms and Bellman Ford and that kind of stuff, and then um, and then tech. Yeah, apparently the bulletin for this course needs to be updated. You know, I'm, I'm going through this is like it talks about AVL trees and 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 self balancing trees. I'm like, we don't. That's not in this textbook. And so I'm, no, the other professors don't cover that as well. That's no problem. But uh, it does mention a project. So regardless, 
this might be worth 10% project. Um, since there were two of you registered, and as long as it's like three, I think a, you know, a good exercise would be simply later on in the semester having you prepare like a short lecture, let's talk about like 20 minutes on one of the topics from the book. You know, because I'm a firm believer of the best way to master material is to teach it to others. So, um, but we'll announce that later on. Uh, final exam worth 25%. I'm just trying to make this in, I'm trying to do this as close as possible to the way that uh, this is done on, um, in, in main campus. Um, tentatively, we're going to start by going over the prologue today. We'll see how, again, I've never taught this course before, so I don't know how quickly we're going to blaze through the material. And also, I have a tendency to really talk fast. But then again, we'll see. Um, so accessibility, right? If you need an accommodation, let me know. If you want, um, and if, and... Uh, general, and then there's a general academic dishonesty statement. I, I need to post the, I've worked on a more up-to-date one of this, and apparently I just never uploaded it. Uh, don't cheat in the course, you know. Um, if you ha are stuck on problems, please come to me instead, and I'll try to help you through them. I'm generally very lenient about late work, you know, so. All right. Any questions before, uh, beforehand? So it's a two hours lecture. Oh yeah, totally. Oh yeah, I'm not going to lecture. I, I can totally listen to the sound of my own voice for two and a half hours, but um, I don't think the rest of you can tolerate that. Um, yeah, I figure we can uh, we can we can have a break. Ideally, I'll try to see, figure out ways to break it up with um, with not only just lecture, but also giving you time to maybe work on a few of the homework assignments. Um, so first, I want to get kind of baseline knowledge from, from y'all because I was going, I was meeting with Professor Sorolis a couple days ago on Friday, and you know I was going through the top of the book, and he's like, "Oh, I teach these things," you know. So I was just wondering, like, um, for a lot of this work, like, so we have this big topic list here, again. Um, yeah, we have this big topic list about. Um, uh, so, question is like, have you how much asymptotic analysis have you done? Like, basically, you know, big O notation, big theta, big omega. How much do you are you familiar with that? We've done all three of them. We know the theory behind it. I would say we've actually done. Okay, so have you gone? So you've not had to. So this is for chapter two, but you've not gone over the master theorem. We have something called the master theorem, which which uh, which is which is very well noted, but it's the theorem that tells us, given a recurrence relation, like a T of n that's defined recur with, as, a, as, a, as a recursive t um, algorithm, uh, we, can figure, we can figure out what the big O runtime of that is um, using the rules of the theorem. So, no. All right. Um, how about ar arithmetic? Just like how do computers do math? And that kind of stuff, or um, or like the run, or rather the run. Have you guys gone over to the big O time of math? Yes, math takes big O time. I think we maybe scratched it in a low level programming. Excellent. Okay. So so it sounds like not too. It, do, it doesn't sound like I'll be du I'll be boring you. Is the point? That's I don't I don't mind. I'm, I'm I don't um, I just don't want to be boring. So if you've um, so like I'm sure you've gone over merge sort before. In 2168, I mean, I make a point of doing that in 2168. Um, so, and then, oh, they don't do RSA here? Okay. So, do you know what I mean when I say RSA? No. Awesome. RSA is great. It's, um, it's, uh, it's public-private key encryption. So, um, and it's basically the entire reason this book teaches us modular arithmetic. Um, again, I don't know how much time we have. The main things I want to I want to cover here are I want, do want to go over kind of this modular arithmetic stuff because I retaught it to myself after forgetting all of it. And by gosh, if I had to relearn it, you're going to learn it. Um, um, you know, um, we'll be talking about recurrence relations because we need to learn about the master's theorem. The master theorem. Um, we definitely want to talk about uh, matrix multiplication. Just make sure you can see. Okay. Uh, how, what is the upper bounds on time it takes to multiply matrices 
and then it's how it's a continuous race to see who can shrink the um, the degree of uh, of the polynomial that we're dealing with. Um, I'm sure you've all talked about graphs like strongly connected components and stuff. De de uh, you, de if I say directed acyclic graph, does that ring bells? Yes. Okay, great. So we'll talk about those. You've done Dijkstra's, I'm, I'm sure. Have you done, because, I mean, it's mandatory. If, you, if somebody mentions graphs in a computer science class, you learn Dijkstra's even if you've learned it seven times before. It's happened to me in graduate school where they reteach Dijkstra, just in case somebody didn't know it. You said, but you've learned Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, right? Yeah. 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 This, it's, this, it's the one it's that you, exactly. it's, the one, it's the one you use for shortest paths. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So we also will go over Bellman Ford, which is another one. It covers um, where Dijkstra fails, which is um, negative cycles. Um, and Dijkstra does, just doesn't know how to deal with that um, and other things. We'll also cover some greedy algorithms, specifically minimum spanning tree and set co cover. Um, we'll most likely have the midterm after the graphs. After that, I plan on hitting dynamic programming. Uh, they've listed linear programming in like our, our things and our, the simplex algorithm, but I don't remember going over that. I don't remember, and they say that, and main campus says they don't normally teach that. What, I'm, what I really care about also is NP completeness. Um, you're talking about NP versus NP hard versus, poly, you know, and I'm sure you have had no introduction to NP stuff, non-deterministic polynomial, because um, that deals with luck. Um, in, in a way. All right, so it does sound like this is the approach that, that, that the way I've been preparing it is appropriate. Um, also, just for funsies, this is the text same, this, is, this copy isn't the same, but again, this textbook, the one we'll be using, is the same topic, uh, textbook I used as an undergraduate for my algorithms class, so it's a good one. It's, there's, and I'm very glad it hasn't been updated, um, so, but it's very, very good. So again, these slides have been updated and stuff, um, so the idea here is uh, algorithm. So computer science is the study of algorithms. That is the not wrong definition. You ask a bunch of computer scientists what the de what 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 is computer science? You know, it, it, that's a very badly named uh, term for the field of study because like biology is not microscope science and astronomy is not telescope science, right? It's so computer science is poorly named. Sometimes you call it's called informatics, right? Which is a bit better. Um, but at the end of the day, if you uh, if we were to define computer science, a lot uh, people would you might get some squabbling over it, but people would agree that the study of algorithms is not a wrong definition. So if you're in this class, then obviously that means we're in the class that makes computer scientists computer scientists, uh, as opposed to some other field. Um, so. Knuth, who is basically possibly the most important writer for computer science in terms of books, he wrote the, uh, this book called *The Art of Computer Programming*, which is about, which is essentially, it's not, it's not the Bible for computer programming. It's the Vatican archives. It is basically the the, the definitive source uh, and things. So he defines an algorithm as a finite, definite, effective procedure with some input and output. I like the uh, uh, the the definition that I've seen that I've have written down from uh, someone else uh, personally for my uh, lecture from intro from introduction to computer science because I can you can define those uh, a bit better. An algorithm is a let's see is a well ordered a set of well ordered unambiguous operations that yield some result in a finite amount of time. Well ordered meaning that there is a very specific ordering of things. There's a first, or, you know, you have a first operation, a second operation, third operation. There's no mixing up the order in which things occur. Unambiguous. There's no way to misinterpret these operations, right? Um, you know, the computer because the computer can't have room to, for ambiguity. It needs no. When you tell it to do something, it's going to do something. Yields some result, right? It has an output in a finite amount of time, meaning that it's not going to go on forever. It's going to do something, you know, and it's going to do it um, at some point. Finite, definite, it's going to do something. Effective, meaning it's going to work on something with some input and some output. Um, the etymology for algorithm uh, is not either of these. It comes from uh, Mohammed ibn al 
I'm oh, sorry, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, I probably butchered that name, but he was a Persian mathematician. His Latinized name is al uh, That is how his name got um, uh, Latinized. What he did is that, he, is that he saw, you know, prior to this, prior to him, everybody was doing math with all these, uh, with these Roman numerals, which were a bit of a pain in the butt to do any math with, because they, I mean, give me a sec. Yeah, I mean, like, okay. Right. Try doing effective math with x, you know, x v i plus uh, x x i, you know, v. Try doing effective math like that. It just doesn't work, you know. Um, anyway, Algermitty noticed there these were the, these were there were these uh, base ten digits coming out of India, and he's like, I should write a book on how to work with these because this is much easier. So he took the the in those those numbers coming out of India translated it. That's why they're called Arabic numerals a lot of the time. And then uh, he wrote a book called Kitab Al Jaber, uh, and I'm not going to even try to pr pronounce the rest. But that important word there, Al Jaber, meaning ordering. Algebra. He wrote the first textbook on algebra, um, and it, among other things. So fairly important guy in the, in, in when when it comes to like how we develop mathematics. Um, a lot of what we've been having to do, as you well note, is algorithms. How do we cook fast? How do we uh, get a high GPA? Or what tasks should we do next? Task scheduling, what com operations that our computers do next? That's important. How to drive from Philly to San Francisco across the US. It's the shortest path algorithm. Let me tell you, it's actually quite a long, the longest drive I've ever done was from Destin, Florida to Phoenix, Arizona. That took about 24 hours of driving, not including stops. So that was, um, it's a lot of driving to get across the states. Um, who to marry, stable matching, it's a fun, funny one to put. But there's a lot of, but in, but in more real fields, uh, you know, non-jokes -joke, aside, internet, web searching, packet routing, distributed file sharing, figuring out those kind of things. Distributed file sharing was where I did a lot of my research area. Um, and, and kind of applying that as to not just how we do file uh, sharing files, but sharing work. Biology, protein folding's a big one. Um, in fact, biology is always big because there's always uh, some disease that needs that we need to throw com computational horsepower at. And the more efficient we can do that, the sooner we can find cures, which means the longer people live. Um, computers, figuring out using computers to figure out better ways to build processors. That's circuit layout. Better ways to build databases. What's the optimal way to cache data on processors? Networking, compilers, all sorts of stuff. Um, a lot of times, compilers do a lot of optimization for, of your code for you these days, so you don't have to worry about it yourself. Computer graphics, I mean, it's gonna make a huge difference for your VR headset if, it takes, uh, if it's a different order of magnitude to render something. Um, security, making sure that the algorithm, you know, making sure you have a secure algorithm to make sure that your uh, messages can't be intercepted. Multimedia, H, so, all, so these things over here, different compression algorithms, different ways of encoding data in either a lossy or lossless format. We'll talk about that later. Did, um, have, did you ever go over Huffman encoding? So you, did, so you went Huffman compression um, with Huffman trees? Okay, great. Yeah. So that's 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 an example of lossless compression because you because the data is not thrown out. MP3s and JPEGs you can throw out data because the human eyes and ears are imperfect anyway. They and so we can so as long as we send the the brain an approximation of an image that's often good enough. Um, social networks that's all about graph theory these days or always been all about graph theory but also then recommendations algorithms to keep you. Um, addicted to that screen to keep scrolling. Physics, that's a big one. Tons of algorithms are everywhere for computer science. So for a lot of, there's a lot of problems and unfortunately there is a lot of um, brute force that needs to be uh, happened. Basically checking every possible solution. The classic example of terrible problems is the traveling salesperson problem, or as it's often referred to as the TSP, traveling salesperson problem, which simply says from we've got a traveling salesperson and you've got basically uh, 
you've got some major cities. Let's do five right over here. Uh, five major cities. You can, start at, you can start at any city and fly to any of the other cities because they're all major airport hubs. So the salesman has to travel to all five cities. Um, how can he, what, and what order should he go, should, should he fly to the cities in and visit them in order to minimize the cost? Because as you well know, sometimes it's cheaper instead of flying, even though A and B might be closer, sometimes it's cheaper to go uh, C to B. You know, sometimes the, the indirect flight is a cheaper fr uh, option because of the way a airlines schedule things. So the ch traveling salesperson problem says, what is the cheapest route? And unfortunately, our best algorithm, some are unfortunately, it's not our best algorithm, but like the best algorithms we have are still on the order of magnitude of we need to check every possible permutation of this. We need to check every possible ordering of this, um, which is five, check five options first, then check four options, then check three options, then check two options, then check one, which is n factorial, which is not good. So typically we want to avoid problems of, uh, that ha we typically want to avoid solutions that have, that have big O times that look like this, 2 to the n or old n factorial. Those are uh, times that we want to avoid. Um, ideally, when the input size doubles, the algorithm should only slow down by a certain constant factor. In other words, with like O of n squared algorithms, if we double, if we double it, then the size should basically slow down by, a, uh, it should take about 400% slower. Um, so the idea here is that we want to try to get our run times to be n to the dth, where we have some degree. This isn't terrible. It isn't great if, if d is above 2, right? If we're, if we're running in cubic time, that's not great. A lot of algorithms we have are O of n squared, and that's a, that's a, that's a decent run time for a lot of problems. That's sometimes the best we can get. But the idea here is that we can, uh, is, is that as, as the input size doubled, we should only be able to slow it down. Um, So we will say, so for the purpose of this class, we'll say an algorithm efficient if it has that poly, uh, polynomial runtime. If the O, if the, so an efficient algorithm is one that has O of n to the D. Um, and it really works in practice. Although, as I was reading, this is kind of, uh, so, you know, poly times algorithm, people develop, have low constants and low exponents. That's generally the way it works. Like it will, like when we say T of n, the time for the algorithm, it will be equal to c to the n d, and these and c and d will be very low, and that's better than two to the n, where the problem size doubles as n increase as n increases by one step. That said, that said, um, there are exceptions to this, specifically. Like over here, map graphs in polynomial time. Uh, if I if I checked over the, I checked over um, in another slide, and it said that the run time for this, and I don't, and I probably have to look it up, was like n to the one twentieth. That's here. That's an exception. Some poly uh, algorithms do have high constants or very high exponents, and that means they're useless essentially. You know. So. What, would you, what kind of runtime would you prefer? 20 to the n is equal to 100th or n plus 0 0.02 natural log of n? And the answer is, well, for small enough, I, for small enough input size, you know, I would think that this smaller one is better, even though it's exponential, even though that's going to be a terrible runtime fairly quickly. If it's small enough, well, I mean, it's going to be... I mean, just think about it. If we set, uh, if we set n is equal, if we set n is equal to, why am I not drawing? Seriously. Yeah, there we go. If we set n is equal to like three, right? N three to the one hundredth power. Sorry, n is equal to three to the one hundredth power. 
Uh, I can't do the math on that. I just know that that's very big. Okay, very big. Versus n to the, which 3 to the first power, well, not the first, but the first plus 0 0.02, so small number, log of n, the natural, so, sorry, not even the log, the natural log of n. I'll get into logarithms in a second, but we really don't care what the base is. We, we just don't. Assume that, assume that if I'm using a log in the class, if it's not ln, if it's not ln, then it's just log base 2, because that's going to make things easier. So, here are some different runtimes we might see. Um, and we can see that, like, for if something, is that, that, um, that anything kind of over here is, is useless. The runtime is kind of beyond the heat death of the universe. Um, so, you know, uh, you can see that those get very bad very quick. But, I mean, like, for, again, for, like, a really small input size, you can do an m factorial algorithm. That's fine. In fact, we'll see today that, like, that for some exponential algorithms, we can get, we can do that in like n is equal to 45 or 40 for some exponential algorithms. Um, and again, and, and even though it says 18 minutes here, well, why? Because these slides were written a long time ago and Moore's law doubles the processing power of, of your computer every like 18, of computers every 18 months. So, you know. That's why we also use this big O runtime to measure our um, to measure things because these runtimes are only like okay if it ran on a specific computer. That's really the, all the runtime will tell you. It'll only tell you for a specific computer and how that specific computer schedules things. All right, so we're going to be talking, and also it's we don't want worst case is not big O. You have different kind of cases that we can use. We have um, worst case scenario. We have, and, and I've got actually a separate set of slides that I found that goes over this very well. We have different, we have basically four different kind of uh, scenarios. We have um, worst case, which is most of what we care about because we assume Murphy's law is in full effect. Murphy's law being whatever can go wrong will go wrong. We are going to assume that we have terrible luck. Um, it's, yeah, it's draconian. In other words, it's, it's not fun, but I mean, like, there's no better alternative because you want to make, because you need to be able to account for those worst case scenarios. But if you've seen with quicksort, that has a worst case scenario of O of n squared, right? But we still use it because its average case, n log n, is effective enough in practice, you know, it happens most of the time. So that brings us to the other time, average case. What's going to happen the vast majority of times you run this? Best case scenario is, you know, nice. It's useful to have, but not really necessary. But it's not, I mean, unless you can guarantee that, uh, that we're going to get the best case scenario, um, it's not really useful. It's going to be useful when we, get, when we look at NP complete algorithms to take a look at the runtime. Um, and then there's one more uh, case, which is amortized which we'll get into, but that's basically the runtime of something if we were to run it a lot of times. What would the average runtime be? So an, ex an example of this is when you're adding something to a, is like when we're doing hash tables or array lists, right? When you add something to an array list, right, the worst case scenario of adding something to an array list is O of n, right? Because worst case scenario for that is that you need to double the size of a list, right? Um, and, and move everything over. But if we were to run like a bunch of, ad, if we were to run a million app, ad operations back to back to get back, you know, so we start out with like a, with a, with a capa array list capacity of 10, that doubles to 20, which doubles to 40, which doubles to 80, which doubles to 116, which doubles to 310, and it's now taking longer and longer between times that we have to make that O of N call. So what we'll say is that because those O of n calls get pro progressively rare, we can kind of distribute it over all the cost, over all the costs, and we say the runtime of that is constant time amortized because the vast majority of the time it is going to be a constant call, and those times where it is O of n isn't going to really matter. Okay, so 
We have a, so any questions so far? Oh, and it's worth mentioning that some exponential times are widely used in practice because the worst case instances are fairly rare. We don't really, and same with, with like, it's the same like with quicksort, where basically, you know, the worst case scenarios don't happen that much. Okay. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and let's see. So we have this annoyingly formal definition of, uh, of um, big O notation, um, which says that, so we've got a bunch of notation over here. So rather than just trying to like read it off, I'm going to try to explain it to you because honestly, um, this is written by mathematicians, and mathematicians seem to think that the, that the shorter that they can write things, the better it is. Like, you know, they'll say things like, they'll use that symbol for, for, for every. You know, for every something there exists, you know, so they make it, they make it very, I mean, it's like there, there's a, like they have to pay for ink or something, I guess. Um, so anyway, so first off, T of n, that's generally the uh, way we say what, an alg what, what the runtime of an algorithm is, T of n, where n is the input size. Now the input size, well, actually n can vary. Um, it's, I, we, oftentimes we'll see it as input size or, as we'll see in the first chapter of the book, the, the bit size, the size in bits of our input. So this says that there's some constant. So we're saying T of n is in, is in f of n if there exists a constant such that c, sorry, exists a constant c is z greater than zero and we have a n naught greater than zero such that r, that T of n is less than or equal to that constant for all n's uh, greater than or equal to n naught. So in other words, what we're saying is that at some arbitrary point in our, and this is very well illustrated by this graph, we're saying that some arbitrary point we can choose, that our algorithm's runtime is going to be bound is going to be bounded by a function. In other words, this function is always going to be greater than that. Another way to see this is that as it approaches infinity, sorry, as as n approaches infinity, you know, like this limit over here, then the ratio between the amount of time it takes divided by the um, what's in the big by the function that's bounded by our big O is going to be less than infinity. In other uh, in other words, uh, the re that means that um, this. That means that the top, that this is small, that this is bigger than T of n, essentially. In other words, this is just a really fun, big O is just really a really funky way of saying less than or equal to. A really funky way of saying, uh, so if we say, sorry, if we say that we've got some function f and it's equal to big O of G of n, that's a really weird, it's just a funky way of saying f is less than or equal to g. They don't like it, but mathematicians don't like us doing that, so that's what we've got. So an example of this is that, again, we've got, um, we've got t of n is equal to 32n squared plus 17n plus 1. t of n is o of n squared. We set c is equal to 50, so in other words, we set 50 n squared, and then we let n not be equal to 1. And if we do that, then this, you know, we, we see 32 n squared plus 17 plus 1 versus 50 n squared. We see that if we set one, n is equal to one, if we set n equal to one, right? What happens? This becomes that becomes. Ugh. Why are you failing me now? Do I like need to refill my? Do I need to add a battery? I bet that's it or something. Okay, so yeah, I bet you it's like running out of battery or something. That's what's probably. Yeah, 
yep, it's 50, and this is like 49, and this is 50, so it's going to be less than that. So after this point, it's always going to be dominated by that. All right? Okay. So again, this is what we were talking about, which is that, um, that O of f of n is a set of functions. Oh, right, this is the important part uh, that I forgot to mention, right? It's O of n squared, but this function's also, it's also valid to write O of n cubed. It's also valid. Not as useful, but it's saying that, you know, O of n cubed would dominate this. You know, a function, that function dominates it. So O of n is a set of functions. We just normally write that T of n is equal to O of f of n rather than using the subset notation. Um, we also assume that our input size is going to be natural numbers, right? Meaning that it's going to actually have, uh, it's going to be our counting numbers. Sometimes we, we restrict our range or we, we use real numbers, in other words, numbers with floating points instead. We also assume that we don't have negative functions. So we have these kind of assumptions in here, which are nice and valid. Big omega is the opposite. It's kind of the lower bound, where basically what we're going to say is that uh, f of n, that the big omega is, that's basic. so if, you know, big O was, uh, was equivalent to us saying that it, if big O was the equivalent to us saying less than or equal to, big omega is equivalent to us saying greater than or equal to, right? So we say that there exists some function that we can say, hey, um, the function in our runtime is, go sorry, the value in our runtime is always going to be greater than the function that we are describing here. Um, not sure why they t say that's a meaningless statement um, because, because that's kind of uh, something that's provable. Um, big theta basically is, the, is, is often, often when computer scientists talk about big O notation, they mean big theta notation a lot of the time, which is that big theta says that, and, and again, you've learned this, you, you've, you've been taught this in previous classes, right? Okay that it takes some run time that's bounded between two, uh, you know, between this, between separate instant, separate constants for this function. Okay. Um, so useful facts, let's see. Actually, let me go ahead and switch the other slides for a second. Okay because I had some nice slides about this uh, stuff over here. Slides. Or I thought I did. Nope, that is the thingy I printed out. Sorry. Like I said, first time I taught this class, so I'm trying to figure out the appropriate time to, to bring in material. <laughs> no, I just don't want to bore you or think, oh no, why, why are we spending your, uh, your, your time? It talks to you about rules, right? But, um, so yes, it's not, yeah, it's uh, not symmetric. It's always, the left is, in instance, is in the right, is a set, is a set of the right. Sorry, is in the right, right? Instead of using, we're using equals instead of is a member of here. Um, so, a few comparisons. So, let's see. So we're gonna go ahead and compare some out. So I, I want, I grab this because of the comparisons that they, that this, um, that this person did in their slides. Um, Okay, great. I don't need the macros anyway. I just need to, I just need it to be full screen. Thanks. <sighs> Thank you, Microsoft, for being uh, trying to be helpful. Um, all right. Come on. Seriously, I hit F F eleven. Normally, that puts it into presentation mode. Bottom right. Yeah, sorry, I almost never use PowerPoint. Aha, security risks. No worries, let's go ahead and cancel. Let's not do that, so, okay. 
So over here we have a couple different functions. We have, um, and we're going to be compare, and com we're going to be comparing them because these are kind of like these, these, and this is a lot of what's going to be going on in your, uh, in your, for your homework, for your first homework. A lot of this kind of comparison: which one is uh, big? Is, is it big? Is one on the left big O? Sorry, big O of the right. Is it bit? Is it big in big theta or big omega? So over here, n three, you know, n cubed plus two n squared versus one hundred n squared plus one hundred, and we see that in it early on, you know, for low values, uh, our our one on the left runs a lot slower, but as our input size increases into the hundreds, then we get a much um, we get a much much yeah laser pointer there we go we get a much hot you know higher amount in uh, for for the red algorithm the n cubed um, it looked good at the start but. It keeps, uh, but, so, okay, over here, this one's very interesting. O of n to point zero. Um, what, is anybody got another way to rewrite that one, by the way? Which is n to the tenth root, you know, I believe it's the, wait, not that one, it is, sorry, butchered that. Got all excited and, and for being clever, but that's effectively the same as saying, really? This is why I never use PowerPoint. All right, square, ten, it's saying it's the 10th root of that. That's another way of rewriting it, the 10th root of that. Um, and you know, it seems like log doing log time is much worse, but eventually, eventually, as we get to 10 to the 17th power, you know, eventually it, it, it kind of crossed over. It took a while, but it got there. Um, but I mean, like, so in other words, so here's, here's the point. It doesn't matter how small this is. This is always, the, the big O is, uh, uh, is always, you know, log n is always going to be big O of a polynomial. Polyno it's always, polynomials always run slower. Uh, over here, again, these grow at the same, uh, these grow at the same rate. Effectively, the only difference is the constant, right? That's the only difference. They both grow in a, line, in a, in a linear number of steps. Right. Or do they? Larger terms, not. Yep, yep. O of n, they grow in a linear number of steps. It looks like this is like uh, going to be curved, but I mean, as we zoom out again, they, it just see they're both straight lines. Effectively, they're dominated by the fact that we've got uh, n to the first power. Um, 5n to the fifth versus n factorial. n factorial gets very big very quickly. 5 to 10, and it just rockets up into the, into the point where we start needing scientific notation. n factorial is huge. There's very few things that are bigger than n factorial. Um, all right, so this one's... Uh, this one's weird. Again, we can rewrite this as um, 2 to the n divide, and this is just from the fact that he's just trying to put math equations in Word, and it's not really, and Word's not very nice about that sometimes. n to the 15th power in the denominator, okay, over 100. Make sense to everybody? Okay, versus 1,000 n to the 15th. And the point he's trying to make here is this. It looks like blue, the one on the right, is going to be, it's just shooting up. It's going to take a lot of steps. But as we get to two, into the 200 range, the, 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 this term starts dominating. It starts dominating a lot. You do not want 
you, you want to avoid having uh, exponential time. Exponential will always beat any polynomial time in terms of how, in terms of the amount of time it will take. Okay, so this one's a bit weird because of this. 8 to the 2 log n. Uh, and the notes say here that we can reduce this term to n to the 6th because logarithms be weird. Um, so, and, and that's, I, I, that, I, did, I worked that out myself a couple of days ago. Let's see, did I write it, bother writing it down in my notes? Did I? Let's see. No, I wrote a different one down. Interesting. Regard. Oh, no, I did write it down. So, um, right, so what's going on over here? So, um, 8 to the 2 log n. Let's go ahead and rewrite that again. Uh, logarithms, again, we can, if, if you see something in, with base, with, that's a logarithm in the um, base, uh, it's something to keep in mind because, again, 8 to the squared, 8, I think that's, no, it's, they're multiplied together, so it would be, so let's go ahead and see. Since they're multiplied together, it would be 8 to the squared to the log n, right? Yeah, since they're multiplied together, no, 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 I'm butchering it again. Here we go. Regardless, let's go ahead and just, here we go. I know what I'm doing now. 8 to 2 log n. We can reduce this 8 to what? 2 to the 3rd. Right? So 2 to the 3rd basically makes this entire thing. So that takes this and it basically makes it 2 to the 6th. Right? Log n. And uh, when you have, and again, logarithms are base 2. What happens when you have this log and the base in the, in the if, if you have a log in the exponent and its base is in the, well, the base? You can bring it down, which is why this reduces to n over 6. Good use, it's, you'll unfortunately have to re review your rules on logarithms. I'll try my best to avoid like nasty questions like that one on the exam, but... And, and exercises like that, but it's worthwhile to point out to review those. How much time have I used up so far? Uh, 309. 309. 309. So, so over here, the better algorithm is, uh, is displayed, the better one being, you know, the one that, that, that is slower. So we've got some um, we've got some co uh, common names for all these: constant for O of one, logarithmic. The one that is kind of weird is uh, loglinear. I've also I've also heard not just logarithmic like but logarithmic, but I no use loglinear. Everybody understands loglinear. Logarithmic time for log n, loglinear here. Superlinear just means like one plus some kind of constant. Like, you know, in that in this case we're talking about like one plus like oh you know like one point oh one in the exponent. Uh, polynomial is n to the kth power, or n to the dth is the notation I've been using. And exponential just means that we've got an o, we've got an n in the exponent. We do not want that to happen. All right. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we have. We'll be doing different types of analyses on here. The one we typically care about is worst case scenario. I like that description where your worst enemy is choosing your input. Average case means that, uh, you know, on average, some probabilistic distribution. Amortize is the one that we care about for array lists and hash tables when we're doing a lot of operations in, you know, successively. How much does the operation cost on average? So. So let's see. I do not want to keep my uh, ink annotations. No. That was useful. 
I don't know how well it will go, be uh, matched in OBS, but we'll see. Okay, going back over here. So, in that case, I think it's, since we've been lecturing for an hour, I think it's actually a good time to take a break, uh, to both take a break and to, uh, to do these. Now, I mentioned that I did these, that I uploaded these out. Um, and I only printed out two, but it does say on there to work together. So you did just the homework? No, that we're going to do this right now. Okay. We're going we're gonna to work through these together. So if you, need a pen, if you need a pen or a pencil, I've got an extra pen over here. Now if we look at this, we've got basically a nice big Venn diagram of O of N versus Ome you know, big omega. You know, functions that would be on one side and functions on the other. So, uh, working together, based on the Venn diagram, tell me whether each function is O of n squared, omega of n squared, or both. Okay? So, that, let's work, so go ahead and work on that part first. And you guys can talk, by the way. You can talk. And, and consult with me. This is not this is not homework. This is an in-class exercise. I mean, we've got this over here. Ovens. So yeah, what about that first one? O of n squared plus two over n. What? How should you distribute that out, right? What would you say the O of ten time was for that? Just with without O of n squared or o of n. yeah, it's O of n, right? So it's O of n because that that because that we you know that division happens. Mm -hmm. So is that O of n squared as well? Omega of n squared? Uh, I mean, technically, it should be O of n squared. It is O of n squared. Yeah. I mean, what? That's right, because it's going to always, because uh, n squared does n is not an appropriate lower bound for it. O of n cubed is a... For which one? C should be both, right? Yeah, it's both because it's in, it's squarely it's n squared because we can always ignore that that lowest term. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the x it's it's two to the so two to the n, right? It's not bounded by an x, you know, it's exponential time. It's um, you know, looking again back over this one. Yep, yeah, meaning it's. Going to be bigger than yep. It's going. It's going to be a, act as the lower bound essentially. So for questions two to eight, we've got um, some. We've got some uh, graphs at the bottom. It's actually like three. It's the same graph. It's just at different zooms. Make sense? We've got f, g, and h being functions. It's defined what they are. N squared n squared, and then cubed, and it describes it as, um, and I, I had to reread this when I, yeah, so determine which function is the biggest between two, when n is between two and four, inclusive. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's useful that we've got a graph right in front of us. Yeah, between two and four, it, uh, f of n does seem to be, the, you know, it seems to, well, hold on a second. Wait a second. They say, yeah, the function is the biggest, not the best. The biggest. Okay. So if it's the best, it would change? If it's the best, well, it, it would, yeah. The best would be, generally we want, when we, generally speaking, we care about runtime. Okay. okay? Um, there are other costs we normally care about. Oh, sorry, we can care about. But generally we care about time the most um, because we can't buy more time. The other costs we care about are space 
uh, generally is generally like space, the amount of memory space it will take up, or the amount of energy that might be consumed. That's a big, you know, that's something we would care about for like laptops and stuff. But you can always buy more energy. You can always buy more lithium ion batteries. You can always hook yourself up to a, you know, to, a, to any kind of power plant you need if you need more energy. But you can't buy more time. You just can't go out to the time shop and say, I'd like an extra hour to expend with my grandmother. You know, you just can't, unfortunately. Um, so, so, but for so that's why we consider time like the most important thing. So we have got four columns representing different intervals, so we're doing the same thing. We've filled in the, uh, a few of them for you. So, and it says basically note that like we we're going to go out of range, so use your best judgment to predict what's going to happen for n is equal to 600. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Medium. Yeah. I like the description. Medium. Yeah, I noticed that too. It's a good. It's a good number. Again, it's just asking about a range. It should be fairly well defined for those ranges. I, whoever wrote this really carefully picked the values. All right. Got three done? Logic sounded, you know, without looking too closely, the logic sounded correctly. Uh, it's correct. Here's, but the big point is point four, which is, does the relative order ever, does it continue, or do the functions ever change, change place again? No. No. Why? Because eight is big O. It's it's big O of n cubed. So I just assume that it's the biggest one overall. Yeah, it's going to dominate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's no, and there's nothing in the functions themselves to basically give them a reason to change place. Any, they've all been growing and not shrink, and, and, and they're at a point where we can ignore um, any kind of fluctuate. There's not going to be any fluctuation past that point. So question five. Look at all the functions in the vi Venn diagram that are O of n squared and omega n squared. What do they have in common? So the ones that are both in that that, that that are in that intersection. We missed it all. We were discussing the life, the universe, and everything. Sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. Uh, so we're on problem um, five, which is look at all the functions of the Venn diagram that are both O of n and o, omega of n. What do they both have? What do those? The one the mm -hmm. highest. There are oh, the T. Uh, Sorry? The highest yeah. order. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. It's the highest order it, n squared. Yep, exactly. Yeah. The highest order is n squared. And now what about the ones that are um, that are in O of n squared but not omega n squared? Their highest order is less than less less than two. All right, so now we're, we're let's go ahead. So now we're talking about the same kind of F E F G, um, you know F G H's, but um, I believe they're the same. Yes, they are. But now we're we were rephrasing the question a bit. So let's go ahead and take a look. Algorithm F takes, you know, what we've already discovered is a linear number of seconds, quadratic, and cubic number of seconds. 
So label each of the statements as true or false, and then let's explain our reasoning. So H is the best choice if we only ever need a small input. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, it's got, if, if, we, if we, like, because that, that, that divided by 1,000 does a lot of work for us early on. Like, um, because, yeah, if the biggest size, 10, what is that? 10 cubed, it's 1,000, so it's one second on worst case. Algorithm G would be the best choice if we need very large n greater than 10 to the sixth problems. Algorithm G, so that is n squared over 2 minus n. So is that the best one for very large? Is that, is that going to have the, is, in other words, is algorithm G going to have the fastest runtime? And when it's very large, no, no. no. Which one? Which one should have? Yeah, F, F. Because at that point, you know, when we, this is the useful thing for a big O notation. Always ask yourself, what happens if we, you know, it's sometimes hard to think about. Okay, what happens when, when, when n approaches infinity, like that limit kind of thing? Because we're humans. We're our puny human minds have difficulty grasping the concept of infinity. So just to ask yourself, what happens when n becomes really freaking big? Um, and, you know, really freaking big is either 10 to the 6. I like to use, you know, I use, like to use Google sometimes, 10 to the 100th, just because it, 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 it generally that, that makes things very apparent what the dominating factor is going to be. Um, so algorithm G takes exactly n squared, over two minus n seconds to solve a problem of size n on any computer. Nope. Yeah, in fact, measuring the seconds it takes is normally useless for doing our comparisons for, from one computer to another. Um, it will run, it just, it, we, we noted that it was for this computer, but this computer is not your computer, your computer is not my computer. Um, it's certainly not a Raspberry Pi that we, that we managed to buy before the before the prices skyrocketed. Um, if algorithm G was on a different computer, there is some constant K such that algorithm G will take K times GN seconds to solve a size N. So if we run, so we have, we have, we have this formula over here that's, again, usefully presented to us. And we're saying, if we ran it on a different computer, there's some k, factor k, uh, that, that, it, that basically will measure the difference in time. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that's pretty much the definition of big O, right? The, uh, uh, of, of the C in the big O notation, right? That, in that formal definition we use, right? That my computer will run faster, your computer will run, you know, slower, but, you know, the rate of growth will not change. You know, there might be some weird, that being said, I might quibble with that and say scheduling, you know, if my computer's very bad at scheduling uh, its tasks, there might be there, but um, anyway. If we need to solve inputs of any size greater than 10, in at most n squared divided by four minus n over two, we run algorithm g at sufficient, on a sufficiently fast computer. Not would it be the best, but could we do G, the one that's, o of n, that's got O of n squared? Again, the G, let's see. N squared minus N2. And all, this is asking essentially, is it bounded? in at most questions. So, let's see. I don't understand the question. Okay, so it's saying basically that we've got, um, that, that we need to get it done is that it, within a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. We know that, um, we know that our computer runs it in that, using G, 
runs it in n squared over 2 minus n time. And it's saying is if we needed to, for any size ten, uh, 10, greater than or equal to 10, if we need to solve it at, at most n squared over 4 minus n over 2 time, we could find a computer that could do that time. And once again, let's go ahead and relate it to here, right? If we were to run algorithm G on a different computer, there's some factor K that will, that algorithm G, K, G will, will take K to the G of N. Yep. Yep, K is one half. In this case, it's what it's saying. It's this D and E are just we diff it's D E is a very weird way to rephrase D. What it's saying is that there's a compute that basically there's a linear factor, a constant factor we can we can multiply by that will modify this in at most. Right? I'd say yes. I could be wrong though. Again, first time I'm teaching this class. <laughs> I believe, though, that, that it is. And then now if we go to the next one, though, now we ask the same things for F and H, right? And the idea here for F, F is our, is our, linear, is our linear time. So if we need to get it done, actually, hold on, going back to the other one. Oh, yeah, sufficiently fast, yes. Okay, so F. Yeah, it's definitely possible because linear time is amazing. Um, and then G, it's asking about our cubic time. It shouldn't be possible. It shouldn't. No. No, no because uh, there's, for any size, we might be able to find, be lucky and find one, but I don't think so. I haven't done the math yet, but honestly, let's see. I mean, it, actually, they've done the math for us, pretty much, with the, with the graph. And it says, basically, at some point, H is just going to become way more expensive than uh, than uh, G is. You know, doesn't you know? At some point, H is just going to be wait. It's going to take way too long. Mm -hmm. All right. Suppose algorithm J. So we've got a completely new algorithm here. Okay, that we haven't seen before. J solves the problem for input size of n in some amount of time that is in the order of n squared, O of n squared. In general, assuming n may be large, we would prefer algorithm J over H. So remember, so what was the big O time for algorithm H? It was, algorithm H was, was O of n cubed divided by 1,000. So what we're saying is that Algorithm J, which is a runtime of O n squared, we'd prefer that as n got really large. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. That's a reasonable statement. All right. Based on the model and your answers to the previous question, match each statement on the left with an appropriate informal definition on the right. Q of n is an arbitrary function. A function Q of n is an O of n squared. Q of n is, so let's see. Model your answer. So let's look at the second one. This one's a useful statement. Eventually, for big enough values of n, our arbitrary function grows at the same rate or more slowly than n, of, than n squared. Does that describe Q of n being O of n squared or omega n squared? Or more slowly? It gr it's, it's O. It's O. Omega meaning, O meaning it grows more slowly, meaning it has a lower degree. That's, that's, that's the, yeah, yeah. It grows more slowly. No, it's so easy to get the two, you know, you know, the, the, because, because we're so, 
we're so used to thinking high numbers good, right? That that's part of the issue there. Okay. Q of n grows more slowly, so let's go ahead and put that as a. I'll say this is a. Q of n grows more slowly than n squared. Q of n grows more slowly than n squared. Is that describing ome O or omega? O. Yep. Q of n is greater than or equal to n squared for big enough values of n. So as n gets really big, it's bigger than or equal equal to omega. omega, yeah, that's B. The definition of Q of n has n squared in it. I assume that means the equation has n squared in it? Oh. Yeah. That one is hard because, honestly, because, we, because, tech, because again, if I'm going to be pedantic here, which I love being, um, then like we, we could say, I, I could technically say Q of n is equal to uh, 2 to the n plus n squared. And it would technically have n squared in it, right? No. So Q of n has, so I would say that's omega because, because, because the only thing we can say is that it's going to be bounded on the lower end by n squared. Can't be bounded on the upper end because I could put anything I want on the upper end in Q of n, you know. Uh, that that one is that that one I would not want to ask on an exam because that's just such a trick question. It doesn't really test anything other than are you are you are you thinking sideways? Um, Wait a minute. So is so is there something about omega for this thing? A and B. O, o versus omega. We're asking is is which. No, no, like I mean for that particular question. Yeah. So whereas, what I'm saying is that like. The Q, definition Q of n, so I assume what they mean is that the, the equation for Q of n has an n squared in it. The only thing we know when it has an n squared in it is that n squared might be the highest term, but it might also be the lowest term. So, in fact, and, and if it's lowest, it could be something like n3. Now, if n cubed or is, if n cubed is in there, then that is a pro, in a pro, then omega n squared is a is an appropriate statement. It's bound, it's always going. This is always going to grow faster than than omega than n squared. But if n cubed in, is in there, it's no longer O of n squared, right? It's no longer bound. It, it, this will grow faster than O of n squared. So that's no longer valid. I'm saying that uh, that any that I can I can always make this to be a true statement, but I can falsify this statement. I can make that statement false. Okay. Q of n eventually grows at a similar rate or more quickly than n squared. Omega. That's omega. It's, it's, again, that means it's bounded on the, on the bottom. And then Q of n is greater than n squared Let's do that first one. Is greater than n squared for all n. That. That's an omega, I think. Okay. So let's go ahead and skip down, I think, because I want to keep moving on. So over here, part 11. If a function is both of those things, right, it's both omega n squared and O of n squared, then we say it's big theta or theta. I'm not sure what the. I don't, I don't do Greek. Um, for, e for, e for each of those functions below functions, tell me whether or not it's uh, theta n squared, and O of n squared, or omega n squared. And if so, tell me why. So A is what? Theta. Yeah, definitely. Definitely theta. B? Theta. Yep, definitely theta as well. Um, okay, this one, C. All right, so when you see square roots, a lot of times it's easy to do that. It, a lot of times you might want to do that conversion. So what's another way? What is the way to write, uh, yep, n half? So, so now what we can, let's rewrite that. n cubed over, over, yep, n point five over here. I'm just going to do m.5 because that's going to make the, uh, make the next step easier. Over 
some, you know, five over, this is going to be zero. It doesn't matter, okay? We're going to drop that term. It doesn't matter. Now, n cubed minus uh, n half, n to the half power, how do we resolve that? We subtract 0 0.5 out, so this becomes n to the 2.5, okay? So is that the same as O of n squared? No. It's definitely a fast, it's going to be, it's definitely going to dominate. Um, you know, we can, it's definitely going to dominate. So is it big O, is it big, uh, is it big O of n squared, big theta, or big omega? Big omega. Big omega, it's bigger. Okay. D now. Theta. Yep, that's just, that's just, fo you know, foiling it. If you remember, the, if you remember uh, your algebra classes, that's just going to be n squared. But we don't have to actually FOIL it. All, all we care about is that first term, right? n times n squared. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see. n plus n. So now e. Get power of three over two or one point five. I, I I have a preference to do decimals like that for some reason. That's it, it doesn't matter. They're all equiv they're they're all equivalent, right? So that is big O, big theta, big omega. Yep. And now over here, which is n squared times log n. Or big omega. Yep. This is definitely yeah. Once this this is gonna grow. It's gonna not be constant, but it's gonna be. What would you call um, an algorithm like F? Like, um, I don't. Like, poly polylog? polylog? Uh, no, polylog I think is like log squared. You know, uh -huh. I can't remember what it is. There's a couple things where lo where where you've got log square. All right. So we we went ahead and justified our answers. We all we don't have to answer twelve. So let's go ahead and continue. Um, all right, so a couple things here to point out, which is that, again, as we well know, this is, we've got some, some proofs here, some very basic proofs here for stuff that we've been doing the entire time. First off, right, what this is saying is that for any, uh, for let a, all, all these A's are constant, and what we're saying is that we've got a, we've got some polynomial here. All we care about is the highest degree of, We've got some, the time it takes is some polynomial time, but T of n is, oh, we only care about the highest degree polynomial, right? And the reason we, 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 we do this is that, um, is that the limit as n approaches infinity of, of n to the dth power over, uh, oh, sorry, of the polynomial over n to the dth power as n approaches infinity all this is going to cancel out, essentially, and all that we're going to be left with is that highest constant. And that's going to be greater than zero. And the definition of this is that if we've got some, if our time divided by the function is, great, is less than infinity, then it's, then it's uh, big O and big Theta says if it's for big, sorry, for big omega, it doesn't go into this right over here, but for big omega, it's greater than zero. And so this value, AD, is less than, is greater than zero. It's less than infinity. So it's both, it, mat, it, mat, it does both those definitions, meaning it's big theta. Um, this is just saying that we don't care about the log, about, about, um, about the base of a log, of what base we do our log operations in, because if we change the base, okay, if we change the base, then it just becomes a, con then we're just multiplying by a constant for the runtime. This is assuming that we don't have something funky like the power, like, like n is in the base of the logarithm. I've never seen that before, but, uh, you know, but they, they threw that caveat in there, so I guess they thought something of it. Um, logarithms, no matter what, are always smaller than a polynomial. And polynomial, sorry, and exponentials 
sorry, polynomials are always smaller than exponentials. Um, there are some, there are some uh, cases where we will have to express things in terms of big O of multiple variables, okay? So, and that's typically just saying that we've got, and where basically it's typically M and N because, again, mathematicians hate us and use things that sound all very much alike. <laughs> um, so, but what we're saying is that basic, is that basic, so what's an example of this? Uh, an example of this is, is a lot of times where we're, well, with graph algorithms, the most common, as it says over here, like we're breadth first search that's going to take uh, O of N plus O of N time, sorry, O of N, M plus N time, where we have N nodes and M edges because we have to look at every node and every edge to do breadth first search. Um, and those are two separate entities. There are ways we can shorten that when we have some assumptions on the, gra on the graph. And all this is saying is that basically it's the same thing. We've got a function, but it's on two variables instead. That's not too important. And over here, we've got some T of M that is going, again, that it's going to be, that we, that we can pick some constants M naught and N naught out in the distance. And after that point, this is going to be dominated by that function. Our, our time is going to be dominated by that function. And the important thing to mention over here is that, um, so let's take a look at this one. We've got um, mn squared. So we've got this, we've got this term over here, mn, and then we've n cubed over here. Okay? So this is both O of mn squared plus n cubed and mn cubed. Now, why is that? Well, because first off, we can't really pull those two apart, right? We can't pull those two terms apart. For the same reason why we have n log n, we, we can't pull those two terms apart. Make sense? Um, and then n cubed, we don't know if, uh, without assumptions or directions about like, is, does n, is n a whole lot bigger than m? we can't really exclude the n cubed term because n cubed could be a whole lot or m could be a whole lot more, you know. Um, and this m of n cubed simply states that, you know, we can, s this works too because, you know, again, for the same reason that if something is n squared, if we've got an n squared runtime, then that is O of n cubed, right? It's dominated by that. This, we know that this value is going to be bigger than this value. I wish I could just contr hit control Z and erase everything, um, but I have to manually erase it. And that, and this value is going to be greater than this value. So since it's bigger than both, we can just, sim we could simplify it to that. But the former is more accurate. But excluding both of those would be wrong, is what it's saying. Again, unless you know things, like, for instance, when we talk about vertices and edges, like if it's a very dense, you know, if it's a very, uh, you know, if you know that it's a very sparse or very dense graph, you can simplify your terms a whole lot in terms of nodes and edges. Yep. We can say that, and here's that, that definition I was using earlier to say, hey, as, if, as it approaches infinity, what happens to them? This is probably going to be most useful for your homework. Um, that being said, we do care those, even though we've been ignoring those constant factors in practice when we're dealing with things that, you know, real world applications, a lot of times where we can't improve things by an order of magnitude, we do care about that constant factor. But if there's a way to get it fast, you know, uh, it's, you know faster by an order of magnitude, we do care about uh, solve. We should definitely do that first. Um, this computational complexity zoo is one of my favorite videos. Uh, check it out. We will be definitely checking it out later. Also, I've been, they, 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 they linked all my 2168 videos on big O notation, even though I thought, oh, yeah, there's going to be no need for them to reference that. All right, so finally, we're going to end with a discussion of Fibonacci numbers, okay? 
because Fibonacci numbers are great discussions for this. First off, so actually, first off, is everybody comfortable here programming Python? Okay, let me rephrase that. Are you comfortable if I program in Python? Okay, because in this class, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to approach it like, I, like my professor in numerical analysis approached it, uh, which is that uh, if I ask you to program something, I'm not going to care what language you implement it in. Okay? It's, it it's, doesn't matter for this course. Um, what matters, it, it, the math is more important here in the implementation of the algorithms. So here what we've got is we've got the, fib we've got the classic Fibonacci sequence, which is... Um, which is that the next term is, which is that each term is equal to the sum of the, the previous two terms. You've seen this before, surely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. So we've got this great recurrence relation, and I'm sure you've seen you've seen how to, how the bad way to implement it, right? Or no? Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's 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 yeah. Just doing it natively recursively. So let's go ahead and. Yep. So let's go ahead and. Um, so let's go ahead and desktop. We're going to call it. I'm going to call it fib.py. Don't worry about it. Again, I'm just going to do it in Python because I can program very quickly in Python. Fib. Uh, the so the nth Fibonacci number is equal to. So if. So let's go ahead and see what our base case is. Okay. So if n is 0, return 0, right? Or we define the 0 Fibonacci number as 0, and we define the first Fibonacci number as 1. That's really all we need. When we're doing recursion, we always need our base cases, which are those bottom cases, OK? Um, and you, you all have done proof by induction before? Yeah. Okay, great, because I'm going to be using that later in the semester, uh, late in, in a few lectures, at least to kind of cover some stuff for it, all n squared, I think. Okay, if, if there, um, so otherwise a recursive case, fib of, otherwise to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, what we do is that we, we calculate the nth minus one number, Fibonacci number and add it to the n minus two Fibonacci number, right? So we can print fib of 20, the 20th Fibonacci number is going to be zero, apparently? What did I do I wrong? The, sec yeah, I the second one. one should be one. The second one should be one. Oh, yes. OK. I was, this is what happens when you talk and type at the same time. <laughs> so 65, 65. So let's go ahead and calculate, and let's go ahead and just do the, like, fifth Fibonacci number, just to be sure. Yeah, that should be five. And the eighth Fibonacci number should be 21. Yep, that makes sense. OK, great. So now for the 30th Fibonacci number, did you see that for a second, what happened there? That, yeah, there was, a, there was just the slightest pause. So and if I go to 35, A big pause there. Really chugged. Why? What's going on here? It's about the stack. It's 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 about what? The stack, the memory. Like it's it's like when all let me say mm, the end is becoming bigger. So. Yeah, our big. But so what is the, so better yet? What is the runtime for this? Theoretically, it should be n. No, no, no. The way I implemented it right now. Right now. How did I implement this? Can you say that it's uh, n squared? Yeah. Nah. No. Can you say that it's uh, what do you call it? The exclamation mark. N factorial. Close yeah. for that. Um, let me go ahead and write the. Uh, sorry. Let me go ahead and. The exclamation mark. Okay, give me one second. The the runtime for this was all right. So no, 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 no. So yeah. So here, let me write this out. T of n, t of n, the t of n for this function is equal to 
the amount of time it takes to calculate n minus 1 plus the amount of time it takes to calculate n minus 2. And then, so there's our recursive steps. And then we have to do three operations, okay? We have to do three operations. We have to check if it's equal to 0, equal to 1, and then do an addition operation, right? requires you to do two recursive calls. Yes, it is two raised to n, because to calculate the f of n, we have to calculate f of n minus 1 and f of n minus 2. Let's go ahead and, and to calculate f of n minus uh, 1, we have to do f of n minus 2, f of n keep touching my, my pen and it keeps turning off. I probably, I, again, I probably need to like actually put a battery in or something, F or another new battery, F of MI3. And I should note, by the way, look at this inefficiency over here. We've calculated F of, we're going to be calculating F of N on the left and we're going to be calculating it on F of N on right. But basically every time I add, I, so this is going to be F of N minus 3, F of N minus 4. Also, if I decide to go one higher, you know, sorry, if I decide to go one step higher, you know, F of N plus 1, that's essentially going to close to double the amount of time. Now, I believe that um, the amount of time that this is going to take, and I might do this as a homework problem, okay, it tells us, uh, let's see, it tells, anyway, according to the textbook, the runtime for this algorithm is 2 to the um, 0 0.694n, according, according to this. Close enough to 2 of, to the n. It's close enough to 2 to the n, right? It's not 2 to the n specifically because, uh, because you've got, because of that, n minus 1 plus n minus 2, I believe. Or, or rather, another way to put it, it's about 1.6 to the n. It doesn't quite double the amount of work, right? But um, that's very inefficient. Um, and it, we can see this, that basically that every time I would, if I try to calculate another number, it's going to take about twice as long. Even though this is like mathematically correct, it is a correct algorithm. So what about doing something else? Well, there's a couple of other ways we can do this. Def fib 2, right, of n. And that is that, let's see over here. For this one, sorry, one second. We have, so there, there's our first one. Yeah, to calculate this, we would, yeah, even a superpower compu super computer would need 10 to the 17th years to calculate uh, the, the 200th one. So this is not a good algorithm for that. But on the other hand, we can use this one right over here. It's a linear algorithm, actually. Not just polynomial, it's linear. What we do over here and you'll, by the way, the textbook is programming language agnostic. It uses pseudocode and mathematical symbols to do everything. So, so if n is equal to 0, you know, return 0. Create an array where we, uh, an array where then each number is, fill, is filled in. Okay? Um, so, and then we just simply and what we've done here is that, is that we work from the bottom up. And we say, hey, if it's, um, we, we just simply to calculate, we look at what we've already calculated. So very simple over here. What we can do is we can say, um, so fun thing in Python you can do is that you can say, um, so I'm going to call this my, my, my table just for ease of use. My, my lookup table is equal to, um, we need, um, 
let's see, what did it say? Once zero up to n, so there needs to be n plus one, and, you know, it needs to be size n plus one. This is how you create a, a, a list in Python that it has n minus n plus one entries in it. Because uh, Python, that, that just simply basically makes a lot of zeros and glues them together. Um, we say table one is equal to one. For i in range two up to, but not including n. Well, actually, up to, but not including n plus one, yeah. Table i is equal to i table i minus one, the previous entry in the table plus the, and we can also actually do this recursively as well. We could implement this recursively by just, if we wanted to keep the recursion, we would just pass this table in as an argument. Okay. Return. Um, and then if we want to calculate, and we want the biggest number, uh, so if, you don't, if you're unfamiliar with Python, any guesses as to what that does if, you're, if you don't know Python? Goes to the highest one. Yep, it's the last. It, you can use negative indices for, and negative one being the last, very last index in the list. Negative two is second to last. It's a very useful notation. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Python, um, if you know what you're doing with Python. And boom, it just kind of just spat, and that, notice now it just spat out that number, no problem. Mm -hmm. So. Also, the other reason I'm a big fan of Python is that I can do things like this, f to the 200, and it just has no problem with it. Um, notice that I didn't have to specify whether it, was an, it doesn't care about integer or long overflow over here. It just does it. Okay, so let's talk about, um, sorry? Yes, there is always a time space trade that, that it's always, but here's the thing. Um, first off, the savings, as you can see, versus exponential versus linear, totally worth it. No and again, a lot of algorithms, they won't, like, so you've used hash tables. The big thing about hash tables in terms of efficiency is, so hash maps, hash sets, is that you've got a ton of wasted space, right? Mm -hmm. Like half to 75%, sorry, half to 25% of that of a hash table is just wasted space. But it gives us constant lookup time, amortized constant lookup time. But point being, so on average, I can basically expect to see things instantly. And that's acceptable because we can always buy more space. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't care to you know, make your things as space efficient as possible too. But like, yes, there's all, there, we, we, are, we are making a trade-off here. Although you could argue that because, as you were mentioning earlier, I believe, with the stack, that we are using a bunch of memory with the stack as well over here, with our runtime stack. So this definitely uses less of that memory. Now, let's talk about your homework um, that we have, okay? So your homework for, on, for now is very similar to those last bits of the exercise we were doing. It's chapter zero. Um, and and do of each of the following in the textbook, which is exercise 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. And I've copied them here for your, um, each of them is worth five points, but I'm definitely the kind of person who definitely says, like, it's homework, you should go back and correct your work if it's wrong. <laughs> um, so basically I want you to know if is f o of g, f omega of g, or f of theta of g. In other words, is f less than uh, g, is it greater than, or is it equal to, right? Um, and there's some interesting ones over here that, you know, might give you pause. Um, when in doubt, right, see, what ha see if you can either simplify it or if you can, what happens to it as you make numbers bigger, much, much, much bigger, you know. Um, number two is, is basically show that for some positive number um, that uh, for some positive number for a, b, and c, what happens if c is less than one, it's equal to one, 
or greater than one. In other words, geometric series. Um, you know, if you want to technically, I love proof by contradiction and proof by induction are good tools he, here, especially if you're going to be when we get to recursion. Now, what we'll be talking about next lecture is uh, for chapter with chapter one. Now, in chapter one, we'll be talking about how to how to add and multiply numbers. Yes, how to add and multiply numbers. Yes, we've got, I, you you know how to do it, but we're going to be uh, looking at it. But as a small preview, what I want to say is that those kind of operations, adding and multiplying, these are definitely things that fall in P, which is the domain of polynomial versus non-polynomial. The way we know our algorithms are correct and the way we do the algorithms is by, you know, doing them. The way I would check is 51 plus 60, 111. The way I would do that is, and confirm that answer is correct is by doing the math myself, right? So that's one of the kind of indicators that the, with those problems being easy. Again, look at the computational complexity too. The other thing we're going to do is we are going to look at modular arithmetic and it's going to be interesting to see. Um, like, you know, it's a very uh, classic kind of question to ask on, I think, I think one of our exam questions is similar to like calculating, um, um, what is it? Like, yeah, question 1.12 on your, on your, uh, uh, Question 1.12 in the, in the textbook is, what is, um, what is 2 to the 2 to the 206 mod 3? And don't use a calculator. Mod 3. So the question... So, so we're going to be learning about modular arithmetic and especially how modular exponentiation like this is actually fairly easy for your computers to calculate. The other things we're going to be reviewing is um, st uh, we're specifically definitely going to be reviewing how to calculate the greatest common denominator, the GCD, and how we care about that for mod and where that comes into play with modular arithmetic. Um, if we have time, we'll talk about security a bit. I don't think we'll be getting it. I don't plan on getting into chapter two like until next, definitely next week because first off, I need time to review all the stuff from chapter two. I pretty much reviewed everything but RSA from chapter one. Um, but again, I, I kind of want to know um, just kind of where, you know, in time to prep for next lecture. So have, have, have you been taught any of the rules for... Um, like if I were to ask you uh, what a modular inverse is, not I'm not asking if you need to calculate a modular inverse. I'm asking, do you know what a mod? When if I talk about a, it, yeah, it's what it's the number that if you multiply something by, it's going to give you one in in a modular space. Is it one? I don't know. Probably. There's a lot of work that goes on to calculate these as uh, as as ones or zeros. Um, the fun thing about modular arithmetic you see is that you can, is that you essentially can substitute anything anytime you want um, as long as it makes sense. For instance, um, if it, we know that this is what? What is two squared? Four. four. Okay. Um, what is four mod three? This is one to the 2006th power. Um, so it's, or it's congruent, equivalent to one to the 2006th power. If I'm doing that correct, hopefully. I mean, sorry. Similar, in, similarly in the textbook, two to the 345, again in mod, uh, here this one is mod 31 space, okay? That, what we'll see is that we, the way the math works out is that you simply look at it and go, oh, that's 2 to the 5th, right? 32 is 2 to the 5th. So let's try to pull that out, 32 to the 69th power. Here, the 345 divided by 5 gives us 69. So we pulled that, so we pulled that out so we could get 2 to the 5th to the 69th power. So we could calculate 32 to the 69th power, which is the same as saying 1 to the 69th power 
which is one. Modular arithmetic allows us to do some, re it allows us to skip a lot of scary math that we care about. It's pretty cool. Um, we go about, we also talk about Euclid's algorithm for calculating the greatest common denominator. You probably, yes, no, heard about you, you, Euclid's algorithm for greatest common denominator. Um, nope, okay, definitely going on the exam then because I'll be teaching it to you. It's great, well, I mean, well, I mean, I know that Professor Hughes always puts that one on the exam. Definitely will do a couple exercises of it in class. Um, but the reason we care about modular arithmetic is that the idea here is that we can is we will be using it to calculate um, to do encryption. It's used in uh, RSA, which is a uh, encryption protocol. It's not really in use anymore as far as it's been deprecated, I think, but the idea behind it, which is that it, you've got a public private key encryption. Heard the term or no? No. Okay. So let, I, think this, I think it's a good place to start at the end goal. Okay? The idea here between public and private key encryption is that you've got two people, Alice and Bob. A, typically, that, you know, A for Alice, B for Bob, you know? That's why we use Alice and Bob all the time. They're metasyntactic names. Um, and then you've got M, I like to put it. Sometimes it's E for eavesdropper Eve. Um, that's what the book uses. I like to use M for malicious Mallory because she's up to no good. Okay? So, and the idea here is that I want to communicate with Bob, okay, securely as, as, uh, as securely. Uh, and we know that Mallory is going to intercept our message. Okay, she's going to look at it. She's going to be able to eavesdrop. So, but I want to still s communicate securely. Cryptography is the idea that if I'm sending a message, only the intended recipient should be able to see it. So public key and private key encryption go basically says that I've got two keys. Um, one that's public, obviously, and one that's private. Both of us have a public key and a private key. Okay? Okay, the idea here between this is that if I want to send a message, now first off, obviously you keep your private key private. Okay, that's important. You don't tell it to anybody. So it's all private, it's locked away. Bob only knows, Bob knows Bob's private key. Allison knows her private key. And our public keys are public. Anybody can see them. Mallory could see them. And we don't care that she could see them, okay? So the way these work is that the public and private key keys decrypt each other. For instance, if I want to, the way I send a message to Bob is that I encrypt it using the public key. I encrypt a, I use Bob's public key to encrypt my message. So, and then I send that message to him. And now the way that Bob decrypts it is that he uses his private key to unlock it. Make sense? So I can send, so you're providing me with the key to, uh, to, 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 sorry, the key so that I can send it to you and only you know, would know how to decrypt it. I can't even un uh, decrypt it and I know, and I know what the text said in the first place. You know. So that's the idea uh, uh, there. Now it's not foolproof, there's different ways that we could, that, that this could happen. For instance, Mallory could come over here and say, hi, I'm Bob, yes, I'm Bob, here's my public key. It's Bob's public key, don't you know? You know. Um, this is typically referred to as a man in the middle attack and that's definitely uh, an issue for security, but for the purposes of of mathematics, what we care about is that the public key and the private key can do this. Now it works the other way around. Alice can use her private key, sorry, to encrypt something and send it to Bob. And then anybody can decrypt, the, uh, decrypt her message though. Now why would you want to do that? That's actually a reason, why, why would you want to do that? So the, it works the other way around. Alice can take a message, and she can take her message, and she could encrypt it with the private key. She can encrypt it with the private key, and the way it gets decrypted 
is by is that you use the public key to decrypt it. You can you can use either one for encryption. Now, if you want to keep your message secret, you encrypt it with somebody else's public key because it requires the private key. Okay, but why would you want to decrypt encrypt something with a private key? Who has access to the private key? Only you. So if you can so if you send a message and it can be decrypted by the private key by the public key, what does that imply? The me the message is from Alice. So if Alice encrypts it with her public key, with her private key, I see. It's, it's, meant you, you, it's the verify that's genuinely from you. Yeah, only you could have sent it because only you have the private key, and it can only be and if it's submitted and if it's locked by your private key, it can only be unlocked by the public key. Anybody can unlock it, but everybody knows who must have locked it: you. And this is. This, this, and these can be used con in conjunction with each other to kind of digitally sign your messages. So this is, so this entire theory is very, you know, it's it's really imp important. A lot of security algorithms back in the day were, were um, public were were basic. A lot of security algorithms were relied on the fact that basically we did not know that no we that the adversary did not know what algorithm was being used. Um, first off, though, this has a few fatal flaws in it. First off, how do you know that they don't know what algorithm you're using? Are you sure? Can you trust everybody that nobody's talked? The only way to make sure that, uh, that nobody talks is, to buy, is by killing the people who know how to encrypt these messages, and that's bad news for a mathematician because they like being alive, I guess. Um, so... Um, so yeah, definitely don't want to do that. Also, on a more practical level, uh, if you use an encryption, if you create an encryption scheme like uh, some encryption scheme, you definitely want to subject it to peer review, so that your peers can point out what mistakes you made, and offer improvements. Right. So the entire idea between between with RSA and a bunch of other algorithms is that the way it works is publicly described, but knowing how it works doesn't help you solve it. Make sense? Knowing how it works just makes you know kind of what attacks need to be made on it. It doesn't necessarily tell you, though, um, what works. So RSA is, again, one of these kind of public uh, protocols. Um, and then the idea here with the encryption is that, by the way, it, it, t it takes, like, forever to solve these things. So I definitely want to try to go into RSA because I don't think it's a particularly. I think it's. It, I, I think going into the module arithmetic is um, kind of interesting, but not super interesting unless you actually like talk about it and go into it. Um, now the textbook does talk about it in its preface that basically that it, it they kind of did what they want with it and tr more traditional texts would typically start, you know, with chapter zero, but then they, if, then you would do uh, part two, which is starting at the divide and conquer algorithms. Um, they go over something called the fast Fourier transform. We probably won't have time to do that, but it's worth knowing because I can tell you for a fact that had I remembered it I, uh, when I was being interviewed by Google, I would have done much better on that, on that interview. But that's okay. It's a, it's a pretty niche algorithm, I would say, used for basically finding out the frequency of stuff. All right, but with that, we only have five minutes left, and I think that that's a fine place to stop.